to uh, Mount Calvary Mission Adopters Church here in the city of Goldsboro, North Carolina. We're so happy to have you as our guest this afternoon on this last Friday of the month of March. Uh, as we lead up in this Lent season, as we lead up to the death and the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And we're so humbled and we're so honored to have you share with us this afternoon in this our call to care of words of empowerment and unity prayer. To all of our members and to all of our uh, covenant partners, we say grace and peace unto you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. And this is indeed a beautiful day today, this Friday. And uh, I come um, to just give us reminder of the importance of God so loving the world. Uh, the Bible teaches us that God loves the world so much that he gave an only begotten son that whosoever believes on him uh, shall not perish but have everlasting life. Uh, and from that particular scripture gives me my word of encouragement and finally my unity prayer for all of us today. But I'm reminded also every uh, Friday we like to give you a, a song of encouragement. Uh, this song is by uh, Sister Charlene Harrison. I decided to make Jesus my choice. I decided to make Jesus my choice. And if you get a chance to pull it up on YouTube, pull it up. It's a very inspiring song, a very encouraging song. And it's a song of reminding us that Jesus is the choice that we all have made in order to have a closer walk with God. So please check that out whenever you get an opportunity. And Shelly Harrison is not the only one that recorded that song. There are many other recordings, but uh, check her version out. It sounds really, really good. I would encourage a message uh, this afternoon for Lent uh, comes from the Gospel of St. John. So turn with us to the Gospel of St. John, uh, chapter number 11. We we'll only have two verses, verses 34 and verse 35. Again, it's John chapter 11, verse, verses 34 and 35. Where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Jesus wept. When I was a little boy growing up down in the South, uh, that was my favorite verse. Matter of fact, it's the shortest verse in all of our scripture. And I remember that verse and I didn't know it would be brought back to my memory as an adult. But when I began to look at the weeping of Jesus, I believe, brothers and sisters, and it's encouraging to me and hopefully to you, that the weeping of Jesus is the most powerful human gesture of grief ever known. Let me say that one more time. The weeping of Jesus is the most powerful gesture of human emotion and grief ever known to humanity. Jesus' weeping sets the stage for his impending death. His weeping sets the stage for his last days upon the earth. The Bible says here again, Jesus wept. And again, we know that's the shortest uh, version of all of scripture, but it's the human side. It's his human side of bringing one back, his friend Lazarus, bringing him back uh, from glory to a place where the billows roll, to a place where uh, he will have to get sick again. You know, when Lazarus died, I believe Lazarus believed on Jesus, so believing on Jesus, he was escorted into heaven place where there is no more crying, 
That's encouraging. Uh, it is a place where there's no more sickness. Heaven is a place where there's no more heartache and pain, no more weeping, no more hurting. Uh, yet we see the Lord here as he shed tears at his grave site, in this atmosphere of professional mourners, right? But yet Jesus says, where have you laid him? And he wept because now that person who had gone to be in heaven with God has to come back to where he would get sick again. He has to come back to earth where he will eventually die again. So Jesus' tears uh, represents uh, entering into Mary and Martha's pain. Jesus crying and his vexations represents entering into their situation of bereavement. Brothers and sisters, you know how it is when we lose a loved one, whether it's a husband, wife, or a child, or a grandchild, or just a close friend or a church member that we're close to. We enter into their bereavement, right, to uh, give uh, condolences to what they're going through but because we're so close to them, it causes us to have emotions. It causes us to have feelings and anxieties and pain because that person that was once with us, right, that we love, is no longer with us. So Jesus showed his human emotions when it says Jesus wept. And in my conclusion, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, there is some encouragement, although it's sadness, but God, in his own wisdom and power, can change our tears into encouragement. Uh, there are three things expressed when I begin to look at the tears of Jesus. There are three things that's expressed to me that I want to share with you. When I began to really understand and look at the tears and Jesus weeping, it magnifies something in my eyes and in my mind and in my heart that number one, it presents the vexation of heaven's agony. And I know Brother Turner is putting that in there so you can write it down. But it shows or it presents the vexation. That means, vexation means something that bothers us. Of heaven's agony. And I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the heaven agonizes because of us. <coughs> heaven agonizes. Heaven moves and it quakes because of what we have to go through. It agonizes because sin is running rampant and irritates the foundation. <coughs> it irritates the foundation of heaven. God is concerned that we cannot help ourselves and we need some help, right? And because of needing that help in the tears of Jesus, that's it again that it uh, vexates and it agonizes because of what we have to go through and we cannot help ourselves. See, I'll put that down. In the tears of Jesus, in the tears of Jesus, not only do I see the vexations of heaven's agony, also number two, as encouragement, I see the ventilation of heaven's sympathy. Right? The ventilation, the airing out of something. We ventilate, you know what a ventilate, ventilation is, is the ventilation of heaven's sympathy. Brothers and sisters, heaven, where God sits, right, sympathizes with our sinful condition. It sympathizes with us. Not only does it agonize, but it sympathizes. 
Because I want to suggest to you this afternoon, when we try to do good, when we try to say something that's good or do something that's good to help somebody, when we try to walk holy unto our God and live a life of righteousness, justified before God, the Bible teaches us that evil is always around us. All right? It's always present. And sometimes, unfortunately, many of us have uh, given in to that evil temptation and desires. So heaven sympathizes about what we have to go through because God knows we're trying to do our best and we're trying to live that life that's acceptable unto God. But I tell you, the enemy of God has schemes and devices and those principalities of wickedness that Paul talked about and, and all those things that try to make us turn our back on God. And when I see the tears of Jesus and I see him in his human nature, he weeps and it shows something that's happening in heaven. It shows that heaven sympathy. And last but not least, not only does it show the vexation of heaven's agony or the ventilation of heaven's sympathy, but in the tears of Jesus, lastly, I see the uh, view of heaven's empathy, not sympathy, but empathy. Jesus has gone through what we're going through right now. And so Jesus can empathize with us because we're going through the same thing that he went through. Maybe not being put on the cross literally, but because he lived a purpose-driven life and his ministry was purpose-driven by God, people came against him. The Bible says he was tempted just as we are Yet he knew no sin. He was the perfect son of God. He knew no sin. But yet in that, he empathizes because he knows what it means to be talked about. Jesus knows what it means to be called everything but a child of God. Jesus reminds us in John, if they did it to him, they're going to do it to us. So he empathizes with us. And as he sits there on the right hand of God, he makes intercessions for us because he's been through what we're going through. Been tempted, yet he was without sin. Because of what they did to him, Jesus knows all about our struggles. That's what that song says. And he's able to lead and guide us to victory. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. Resurrection is not only lodged in some distant event, but is available in what God can do for us right now. Resurrection is more than when the dead in Christ shall rise. It's more than us being raptured away. It's more than that. It's more than the blinking and the twinkling of an eye, we shall be changed. It's more than that. It is God living in us right now. Jesus said, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Not just the resurrection to nothing, but resurrection to a new life. Listen. But God is available to us right now. And so when Jesus says, I have the resurrection of life, that means a few things for me. It means it renews us. It uh, reinvigorates us. It revitalizes us. It rejuvenates us. It resuscitates us to a new way of living. All things are passed away, and, be and behold, all things become new. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, 
I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. All things have passed away, so living in Christ, listen, brothers and sisters, it resuscitates us. I got a new way to walk since we've been born again. Got a new way to talk since we've been born again. Jesus shares completely in God's ability to give life. As a resurrection and a life, Jesus defeats the power of death. And let me say this last one to you. When he talks about the resurrection and the life, that means Jesus has defeated the power of what death thought it had over us. Death says it's over. The grave says it's completed. Jesus says, no, no. I am the resurrection. Now that's encouragement right there. I am the resurrection in the life. That simply means two things. That means in our present, the resurrection of the life in our present means that we understand that Jesus came to seek and to save those who were lost like you and I. Jesus can mend by the power of the Holy Spirit, can mend broken hearts. It can heal. The Spirit can give life, it can give sight, can give joy and peace. We can walk in a newness of life with His grace and mercy. So that's one thing. We look at it in the present, the resurrection of the life. And the present is uh, asking you today, do you know that you are healed? Do you know that you are saved? Do you know your life is given over to God? That's a resurrection uh, of life. A resuscitation uh, is being brought back from the dead. Last but not least, not only in our present, but in our future. And I just mentioned a few, a few minutes ago, in our future, the Bible teaches us that the dead in Christ, and that's very important, not just the dead, because all of us got to die, but it puts a disclaimer there. It says the dead in Christ shall rise. Rise with what? Not some disembodied spirit, but we're going to have a new body. Jesus tells Thomas, he says, stick your fingers in my side and in my hand. I'm still Jesus, but I've been raised to a new mode of existence. Now stay with me here. That's not limited by time nor by space. We're going to have a new home in glory somewhere around God's throne. In this Lent season, we have to say, and we have to say like Paul said this question, because we have a new mode, we will have a new mode of existence in the future, and because we're walking the newness of life right now. O oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, grave, where is your victory? It's a rhetorical question. O oh, death, where is your sting? Sting. O oh, grave, where is your victory? Amen. Let us bow his name. Father God, we thank you for this meeting opportunity. We thank you, God, that you have opened the doorway to heaven. And God, we have walk through the doorway to offer this our prayer. Father, we come to you first of all saying, please God, forgive us of our sins. Whatever we have done this week, whatever we have done this year, leading up to this present moment, Father, I intercede for everyone that's listening and watching to please forgive us, God. Father, we ask for forgiveness because we don't want our prayers to be hindered. God, we understand that all have sinned and all of us have come short of your glory. But yet still, God, you still love us. You still forgive us. And wherever we have some wounds, God, you still heal us. So we say thank you, Father. Now, Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you because we know no one else we can call on that can do us any good. Father God, you've been there by our side even when we didn't know it. Father God, you touched us with your finger of love. You woke us up early this Friday morning. 
Father, as we're about to experience another Lenten season, God, where we can celebrate the death, the burial, and the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, Father God, never let us forget the great sacrifice that was given on our behalf. God, judgment said, and the judge said that we must die. Justice, justice demanded that we must die. But God, we thank you for grace and mercy that has made us alive again. And Father God, we give you all the praise, the honor, and the glory. Father, we realize that there are many people that are listening and many people that are watching us this morning. And Father God, they have reached out to you in prayer. But Father, we want to unify those prayers today because we all stand in need of prayer. We all stand in need of a blessing, Father. We all stand in need of a little bit more understanding, Father. A little bit more humility, Father. We all stand in need of your grace and your mercy. And so, Father, I intercede for all of those who are watching us and listening to us to hear this, our prayer, O oh God, and incline thy ear to us. For we need you in these perilous times in which we live. Father, we recognize that we live in times where it seems that men and women are lovers of themselves more than lovers of God. Father, we live in a season where people have heat to themselves, teachers have an itching ears. Father, we live in a season where we hear wars and hear rumors of wars. Father, we live in a season where it seems racism is at its all-time high. Father, we live in a season where it seems that men and women have turned their back on you, Father. Father, we live in a time where people are sick. We live in a time of COVID-19. We live in a time of hatred and dismay. But through it all, God, we trust and believe that you are still with us. And because you live, we can face tomorrow. And because you live, God, we know hope is still with us. So, Father, I reach out to you in this, my prayer, God, to shake the very foundations of heaven. And, God, I ask that you would help somebody, God, first of all, who has fallen by the wayside. There were many, God, that were lifted last year, but, God, for some reason, they have given up on you. But I pray for them, God. Father, I pray for those who are different to your word. Your word is a word of life, but it seems like they're living in a season of death. But God, I thank you for giving us the ability to go tell somebody about the goodness of our God, about how you love us and how you gave your son Jesus to die for our sins. But not only is it his death, God, but in his resurrection on the third day morning. And because he lived, God, we can walk in a newness of life. And so, Father, in that newness of life, help us to go encourage somebody that's in the hospital. Encourage somebody that's on a recovering list. Encourage somebody that all is well if they put it in the hands of the Lord. Father God, we realize that many that are in the hospital that are suffering from some type of physical ailment. But I pray that in the name of Jesus that you would visit the hospital room. Touch the hands of the doctors and the nurses. God, by your power, we ask God that you would help somebody to understand that God is able to heal their body. Oh, Father God, we pray for our members at Mount Calvary, those who ask me time after time, Pastor, would you pray for me? So I offer this prayer to you, God. Father God, we ask that you will bless our covenant partners, those who share in ministry with us here at Mount Calvary. Oh, Father God, they, they didn't have to do it, but God, they thought it was not robbery to be a part of our ministry in their own way. So, Father God, I ask that you would bless their families and bless the ones that are hurting in their life. God, bless our children and our grandchildren. God, bless our society as a whole and help us to heal, God, in our churches and in our communities. We seem like we're more polarized and more separated than ever before. Father God, we've been crying our teeth for a long time. Because God, we don't know what else to do. We've talked to family and friends and we appreciate them, God, but they can only go so far with us. 
Father God, we reached out to our church members and our covenant partners, but they can only go so far with us. So God, now we put it in your hands, Father. Lord, it's in your hand. The song said, I decided to make Jesus my choice. And God, we choose Christ today. We choose the Holy Spirit right now. Amen. So God, would you dwell in us? Keep us from falling. Help us, God, when we need some help. Be with us, God, in the good and bad times. Stay with us on the mountains, but God, be with us in the valley. Sometimes, God, when we aren't sure of what we're supposed to do, Father God, when we feel inadequate of what we're supposed to do, fill us with your Holy Ghost and lead us and guide us in the way we should be. Father, this is your day. And God, we just thank you for allowing us to be here to share this message with somebody. And we thank you, Father, for the word of God that springs forth life to those who are, who are existing and not living. Father God, I give it over to you. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your glory. Thank you for your anointing. In Jesus' name we pray. And the people of God say amen. amen. Thank you so much for joining us. We love you for the love of Christ. Sometimes I understand we may not know your names. We thank you for chiming in with us and to all of our members. We look forward to seeing you this coming Sunday morning uh, where we're going to have a word of God that's going to be presented to you to help to encourage and empower us in this season. Uh, so you have a wonderful and awesome day. And y'all stay safe out there. God bless you.